This week on the Light Wave Paperback Podcast, we delve into the haunting pages of Flowers for Algernon. Originally penned in 1966 by Daniel Keyes, this literary gem undertakes the probing examination of intelligence. Through a lens tinted with existential hues, the narrative embarks on a journey through the convoluted pathways of cognition, inviting readers to confront the very essence of intellect and its resonant echoes with the human experience. Does the purity of intellect inevitably lead to the elusive shores of fulfillment? This enigmatic question reverberates throughout the narrative, compelling listeners to ponder the intricacies of human consciousness and the relentless quest of meaning. In its exploration of the human condition, Flowers for Algernon transcends the boundaries of fiction, offering profound insights into the nature of consciousness and the eternal quest for meaning in its increasingly fragmented world. Join us as we discuss the haunting tale of Flowers for Algernon. Hey, what's up? So this week I read Flowers for Algernon, which is an extremely popular novel. It was written in the 60s, and I believe that many people have probably read this, you know, at some point, or at least know what it's about. I do not think I've ever read it before, so I I don't want to call this a reread, but it's it's kind of strange because I'm not <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent sure whether or not I was assigned this in school. There are certain parts that felt familiar, but I'm not sure if that's because I, I yeah, so I'm calling this or I read it for the first time, but I'm not 100% sure if I've read it for the first time. So that's, that's pretty strange, but there's a good chance that you have read it before. And right up at the top, the first thing I'm going to say is if you've read it before, but you were a kid and you were assigned this at school, just like all books that you were assigned at school, are probably worth rereading as an adult. Flowers for Algernon offers a lot more than I think is given credit for. This book has been the basis of many different interpretations through film and television, and I would argue, having read this the past week, that none of them offer what is actually in the text itself. So if you haven't read Flowers for Algernon as an adult, I highly suggest it. So here's my here's my case of why you should read it. It deals with adult matters. So the main character, Charlie, is from page one, an experiment in a scientific university psychological evaluation. Uh, they're doing some kind of test. So they have the university or a few professors have developed what they believe is a way to increase intelligence through uh, biological means. So there's some kind of biological has, I mean, it's just a, you know, technique for the mo- for the novel to exist. It doesn't really matter, but they, the professors believe they've found something that can increase a human's intelligence or mammals. It was first tested on mice. And so there is a mouse named Algernon, who is where the book gets its title from. They believe that they've increased some of the mice intelligence. So they believe they've increased Algernon's intelligence. Whatever that means, they think they've done it. So now they're experimenting on Charlie and we're we're reading the book through Charlie's eyes. Okay, so this book is Charlie's diary. He's the one writing it. So automatically, I really appreciate the author Key's choice to do this, to to only see it through the experiment's eyes, not the experimenters. So we have no idea what people thought of Charlie before the experiment, during the experiment, or after the experiment, because we only know through Charlie's writing. That's it. And Charlie is someone that has intellectual disabilities. So it's mentioned many times. It's set up very clearly that Charlie has an IQ of around 80. So that's probably a standard deviation one or two below, below the average. So the average IQ humans is 100. And so if he's at 20, that's probably a couple below. 
So this Charlie has a hard life, but he also has things that he doesn't realize he has until they're taken away. So Charlie is in this experiment. I don't remember how he gets involved in the experiment, but from the very beginning, he's in the experiment. So the only reason why he's writing the diary is because they asked him to write the diary. So that's the only reason why we have the book at all is that Charlie is asked to make a diary and document what's going on with him. He works at a bakery. It appears that for the most part, it's almost out of sympathy. He has this job. It's mostly just sweeping up very simple tasks and people, you know, they, I think they kind of look at him like a grown child. That, that seems to be the way he's treated. That seems to be the way people act with him. And this is really exemplified when he's no longer of the intelligence of a child. It drastically changes. All of his relationships change when his intelligence increases. And the whole book is about what what would that do to your relationships? What does that do to the way you perceive the world? What does that do? What does that what does it even mean? What does that mean? Are you going to lose or gain things? That kind of thing. I absolutely love this book. I, it was I mean, I don't know. It was published well before I was born. So I don't know what it was like when it was first published. I don't know what it was uh, analyzed. If you go on Goodreads, it has pretty mediocre reviews, which shocked me. It absolutely shocked me of uh, maybe I shouldn't be surprised of the reviews on Goodreads at this point, but it seems that if I really enjoy a book, it's going to be a 3.5 star. And if I hated it, it's a five star book. <laughs> so I don't, maybe I just have bad taste or something, but it, it seems like Goodreads and me just have two different opinions. I, I love the way the author examines what intelligence, how that is in relationship with relationships and society and just, I mean, I mean, it reads it just so real to me it just i mean this is i i couldn't even think of how how you could even improve it to me i i mean it's just so well written of just the idea okay some criticism it gets is the use of what i'll call the r word okay so that word that's used i would say and no point in the novel was used as a derogatory word Okay, if this is written in 1966, I feel that it was used exactly how people would have said it at that time. And I don't feel that anyone in the book used it in a derogatory sense. So if this is a diary of someone in 1966, I see no reason to change the language in the book whatsoever. So if someone's reading this book in the 2020s and they're saying, I don't like the use of that word. Well, that's that's fine. That's your opinion. And I understand there's words that I don't want to read about either. That's fine. But I have no problem with this book using the word as they do. There was, I had no sense of whatsoever that this word was misused at any point. I can't think of anything. That isn't to say that this book can be critiqued for anything. But that particular point is hit very hard on Goodreads reviews. Not that we should just focus on what's going on with Goodreads, but I, I don't have any problems with that. The discussion of... What does intelligence do to your relationships? So this novel examines if someone's intelligence is increased at a rapid rate, what would that do to their relationships? Well, the thing that's going to happen is they're going to start noticing things that they are not necessarily aware of before. Okay, we see that with kids. That is someone whose intelligence rapidly changes. Every year, a child's intelligence grows. Okay, so before they didn't understand anything, and now more and more they notice and synthesize what they notice and grow and grow and grow. We know examining children, that is someone whose intelligence does rapidly grow. It just doesn't rapidly grow with adults, okay? That's something that happens to Charlie. He notices things that he wasn't supposed to notice before, and it, it turns out that there was a lot of mental blocks put into place for Charlie, and those blocks are starting to erode. So one of the blocks was he just kind of took everyone as being nice to him, as, as being honest, 
and truthful. And as his intelligence grows, he realizes that he's being manipulated by people, that other people are ma- are manipulating and stealing and cheating. And these are things that are coming to his mind and are not positive thoughts whatsoever. He calls to their attention that he notices these things. They are upset that he calls their attention because as adults, what do we learn? We learn to have kind of a feedback. Is this something I want to bring up? Is this something I should? We have this internal dialogue. He doesn't have any of those emotional intellectual debates because he doesn't have the guardrails because he came it's coming too fast to him which is the same thing that happens with children right they're too honest you know does this shirt make me look fat yes it does they don't they don't have that weighing out the options okay of of being too blunt that's 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 the beauty of a child and that's happening to charlie uh within the matter of weeks So that's strange. He's 33, and then all of a sudden, his intelligence is just growing daily. You know, it seems like by a percentage, like it's increasing by a percentage. So he calls out someone for stealing. He calls out someone for manipulating them. You know, that's going on. And then eventually, without him attempting to, without him meaning to, eventually his intelligence goes beyond those of that are surrounding him socially, right? If it's growing by a percentage every day, eventually he's going to go beyond even average. He's starting to consume things that, you know, someone, let's say the average graduate student would become interested in. Okay, so these pretentious things, he's starting to gravitate towards them. His greatest desire was that if they increase my intelligence, I won't be so lonely anymore and I'll have friends because smart people have friends, right? Well, he finds that that's the exact opposite, okay? The more intelligent he becomes, the lonelier he becomes. The more isolated he becomes. He's interested in things that people do not care about whatsoever and find it atrocious that he's interested in them and that he brings it up. They're offended because it makes them feel lesser than. So they make him feel lesser than for enjoying them. It's really sad. I mean, this is a heartbreaking novel, absolutely heartbreaking that this goes on. Okay, so beyond that, uh, there is a a relationship he has with a woman named Alice. He goes on a few dates with her, and all of a sudden, he's dealing with these sexual feelings. This is something I think I could critique Keys with, but... He, he covers his tracks. So he has sexual feelings and it's almost like it's the first time he's ever had them. It's very disturbing to him that he's having these feelings. Well, I mean, he's a 33-year-old man, okay? So I would argue you don't have to be of any intelligence whatsoever. I mean, that's just human nature. But it's set up in the novel that he was extremely shamed as a child by his mother and his parents to never have these feelings. So he has this trauma about uh, sexual feelings and how he's not allowed to have them. So that's kind of where Keys lays it so he's never had these feelings feelings before because there's kind of these guardrails in his mind of any time he ever had those feelings, you know, set the grooves in his mind to not think that way. All right. So I don't know. I don't think that would actually work. I don't think, you know, of any intelligence whatsoever. I'd say across the spectrum, that is just unrelated to your intelligence, but it's set up for the novel and it's interesting. So we'll let it go. But as soon as he has these feelings, uh, he f- he's seen people in the bushes. He's seen people behind him. And a spoiler alert, it turns out it's Charlie. So he uh, sees this as old Charlie. Okay, as he becomes more intelligent, he thinks of that as old Charlie. And I've heard people use these phrases that are not referring to flowers of algebra. That's the old me, right? I've evolved. I've evolved. I've emotionally evolved. So that's the old me. So as weird as it is in the novel, and I think it's, I don't, to me, it read like the weakest point, but as weird as it is, I think people actually do think this way because that's the way they talk. They talk about that's the old me. That's, this is the new me. So people really do that. I don't think they actually envision themselves in the bush watching the new them. You know, I don't think the old you really is in there, right? There's only you right now. So it's kind of silly to 
to talk that way, but people people do talk this way. So you have to imagine that that's the way that's what they believe, and Charlie believes it in a physical sense. So he sees himself. He sees the old him there. Okay, so. He has these sexual feelings. It's it's not gratuitous. Um, I think, you know, I mean, we're talking about adults, so I appreciate that. After reading a lot of science fiction, I do appreciate, you know, an adult, two adults having a relationship. That's that's nice. There's, um, you know, that's, <laughs> that's appropriate. So Charlie has frustrations with relationships because his intelligence is growing so much and then the person he's with feels that he's growing beyond her okay well we see this happen in our own relationships and uh, we see this happen uh, with other people's relationships that oh this person they grew apart they grew apart but him he's growing his intelligence growing percentage daily so yeah i guess that would happen his interest is going to go beyond this she feels you're going to grow beyond me you're going to be bored with me and so she begins to reject him before he can reject her okay that's how people are i that's not a stretch of my imagination that that would happen so i can believe it okay then he meets he goes on a date with someone else he Uh, becomes infatuated with someone else and this is also one of the biggest points of critique is these relationships and how women are written in the book and his relationships with these women and my only argument for the book really is that the, the whole book is written through charlie's eyes he has no i mean he's in he's out of his depth here he has no idea what's going on but his intelligence is growing rapidly and so we do get to examine a little bit of what is the difference between emotional intelligence versus intellectual intelligence and i appreciate that okay so i'm gonna put any kind of awkwardness with the relationships or how that was written towards charlie okay so of course he's gonna have awkward ways of dealing with grown women because he didn't grow up he hasn't grown up yet it would that is still gonna take time to catch up so that that's brought up Eventually, it's in the novel, it's proposed that his intelligence has grown beyond that of the professors that are experimenting on him. He sees flaws in their procedures. He sees flaws in their statistics. He sees flaws in their methods. And he realizes that his intelligence is going to rapidly decline. It has spiked. It's going to spike and then rapidly plummet. What we see with the mouse Algernon is that the mouse is becoming more and more aggressive. And that happens with Charlie. And when this happens, I think for me that's where the novel lost me a bit um i i think when when charlie charlie runs away he becomes infatuated with his neighbor who's kind of artistic and maybe more i don't know bohemian free love smoking pot partying all the time that kind of thing uh he becomes interested in her he becomes interested in that lifestyle to me it was like okay this was written in the 60s this is uh whatever and i i feel like we lost it a little bit on that one for me but nevertheless he becomes more aggressive just like algernon and then at the end of the novel his intelligence does start to decline and he becomes old charlie and uh, this is really sad for him because he's really trying to hold on to it he's trying to hold on to kind of his superpower there of intelligence and he just can't he can't hold on to it it declines and then at the end he really is back where he started he's old charlie and he just i think emotionally he's happier and so that's really disturbing too is the idea that if you had lower intelligence you would be a happier person that's where the novel leaves you it's it's haunting it's haunting to think that that could that could actually be an argument that if you are less intelligent, you might be happier. And that maybe your own brain is causing you pain. That's disturbing. <laughs> so, Flowers for Algernon, a great existential horror. <laughs> what can I say? It's a great book. If you haven't read it as an adult, I highly suggest it. It's a quick read, and I think there's a lot there. And there's things that you'd pick up because you're you that no one else would. And I, I think it's a great book. So I highly suggest rereading Flowers for Algernon. All right. Hey, this one's for the little mouse. See you next time.